Uh, so, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Tiago Castella. I am an architectural historian as well as an architect. And I teach and do research at the University of Coimbra. And uh, my presentation is titled Empire in the City? Question mark. Politicizing Urban Memorials of Colonialism Today. So this, this research is based on field work that I did in, in Portugal and in Mozambique in 2013, 2014 in the framework of a research project titled Urban Aspirations that I coordinated and was funded by FCT, the Portuguese Science and Technology Foundation. And um, this, the results of this particular, uh, of this particular field work were that I'm going to recover today were, were, were published as a book chapter in 2017. So this is, not, this is not new work, but it has become timely. Uh, it's about urban memorials of colonialism. The first times that I presented this work in Portugal, uh, it was met with a frank lack of interest, even by scholars. Uh, you know, why, why well, was I doing this? You know, and, and now it's become uh, timely uh, in view of the recent protests and, and uh, activist actions uh, against urban memorials of colonialism. Uh, so my idea today is kind of, a, you know, recover a little bit of that field work, um, taking into account the, 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 the present day public debates in Portugal. Um, and uh, in particular, I'm going to look at how the man management of urban memorials of colonialism was done differently in Portugal and in Mozambique after uh, political independence in, of Mozambique in, in, and other, uh, other occupied territories in 1975. And uh, what I'm going to foreground is the situation in Portugal uh, of um, what I think is a lack of properly political debate on this issue, even though there's been a lot of you know, uh, public debate and, and public actions. Uh, but I think we have, uh, we scholars, architects, have to um, uh, create the possibilities for a political debate and political de deliberation uh, on this issue um, because otherwise we're just going to continue a tradition of expertise uh, that's uh, very colonial in, in the way in which it is articulated. Um, so the two sections, I'm going to start by talking about the role of uh, urban memorials of colonialism in what I call spatial violence in my work. Um, and the first two sections of the presentation address, um, you know, I'm going to talk. Uh, I'm, I'm going to talk briefly about the tradition of domination in, in, in its construction in, in late colonial, colonial Mozambique, uh, as well as the project of a post-colonial spatial pedagogy during the early period of independence there. And then I'm going to focus on the um, continuing presence in, in uh, Portugal of what I call a pedagogy of inequality through these urban memorials of colonialism. And I employ the term pedagogy in this work because um, the designers and patrons of these of this memorials, and uh, especially the official memorials, uh, Explicitly, explicitly envisioned them as a means of instructing citizens and instructing children also. Uh, so it's important that we take this into account when, when we're discussing these memorials. And, um, you know, in the case of Portugal, despite all the public debate, you know, uh, you know one thing that I think we can say for sure is that uh, when we look at discourse by both uh, officials and citizens, is that a lot of the intended teachings uh, of these memorials are still valued today. Uh, and that's something that, that we have to discuss. And, you know, they're seen as elements of an inoffensive heritage. Um, 
so wha what do I mean by spatial violence? So spatial violence uh, I define as the endangering of actual modes of urban life by urban planning practices. And I include these urban memorials of colonialism in urban planning. And so uh, such practices, uh, urban planning practices, usually invoke normative dichotomies whose contingent formation is elided. For example, in the opposition between legality and illegality, or urbanity and non-urbanity, or normality and abnormality. And this often corresponds to a selective exercise of state power, um, often benefiting privileged citizens. Uh, examples in, of spatial violence, for example, in Comparare Maputo and many other cities today include various known states of fragility uh, experienced by citizens due to the danger of eviction or partial privation of possession, expectancy for the formalization of use of land, or the very persistence of the opposition, for example, in Maputo, between Cidade, the city, and the bairros, the neighborhoods. Um, of course, spatial violence is not an experience exclusive to colonial and post-colonial urbanism, nor of planning by Portuguese-speaking state apparatuses. Uh, however, um, in this presentation, I argue that the spatial violence of an equal urban division is inherent to the representations of bodies as an equal in accent memorials from the colonial era in Lisbon and Porto. Um, and this was inherent in representations of occupation in colonial Lourenço Marx, which uh, was the name of, uh, of Maputo, you know, before 1975, as most of you know. And it was one of these representations of occupation, I'm, I'm going to talk it about it for a bit, uh, is the 1940s fortress, the Fortaleza. Uh, so the Fortaleza has a very interesting history. You know, uh, it's not a real fortress. You know, there used to be a palisade or some kind of enclosure on the site, uh, but it was very, very precarious. Um, the fortress was built in the mid 1940s. You know, it's it's a museum space. Um, and it was, its design was led by Joaquim Arial da Silva, uh, who at the time worked for the, what we call in Portugal, the National Monuments, which, which had been created very recently in, in 1929. And um, Arial da Silva had gained experience, interestingly, um, in participating in a project to rebuild the palace of the of the Dukes of Braganza in Guimarães, you're, you're close to Porto. Uh, so he was already involved in the formation of an authoritarian and colonial state apparatus, investing in developing a unified notion of architectural practice. This sought, among other things, to restore spaces seen as commemorating the history of the Portuguese aristocracy, recast as monuments of a national community characterized by social harmony between the classes. Um, as most Portuguese people know, Guimarães had been designated in journalistic and other publications as the cradle of the nation from the 1940s onwards. Um, but, you know, there was really nothing there. Uh, you know, the palace had been abandoned in the early 1600s and repurposed as army merits in the 19th century. And as the architect that led the design noted in 1942, quote, nothing else remains than walls blackened by the centuries that lent that austere air of respectable ancientness, end quote. So in Lorenz Marx, the situation was uh, even worse, let's say, because there was almost nothing left of the fortress enclosure, which had never been built in stone. Um, and Rialdo Silva faced a different question there. So how could the design suggest the solidity of Portuguese occupation in southern Mozambique that had absolutely no historical foundation? Um, so the, the trading enclosure in Lorenzo Marx had been built in 1781, but um, the Portuguese garrison there 
a very small garrison, had exerted absolutely no control over the polities in the area until the 19th century. And by, by exerting no control, I mean right outside the settlement, the Portuguese settlement, there was absolutely no control. In fact, the settlement had to pay tribute to the polities around it and was sometimes attacked when it failed to do so properly. For example, the Zulu king Dingan ordered these soldiers to attack Lorenz Marx and kill its governor, which they did in 1833 because they hadn't paid enough tribute. Um, you know, in, we're all very informed by the late, in late 19th century European colonialism, but we have to remember that before, uh, you know, industrial capitalism, uh, the history of European colonialism was, was a bit different than, than the one we're, we're more used to. Uh, and by the 1940s in his design, Silva arguably decided to invoke the ideal Portuguese Bastion fortress of the sea against the land, like those built along the Moroccan and Indian coasts from the 16th century onward as part of the formation of Portugal's first empire. And besides conjuring a, a fake history of centuries of Portuguese occupation uh, of the Campfumo polity surrounding the settlement, uh, the building of the Fortaleza created a space of unchanging memo memoriality at the symbolic center of mid 20th century Lorenz March. The museum, which was, would be created in Fortaleza, would also contribute to the broader colonial discourse of the time um, which Giotio Sagrahard uh, has described as, quote, establishing the superiority of a small European minority through the theatrical display of power, end quote. And the rebuilding of the Fortaleza was, or building, was undoubtedly also directed towards South Africans of European origin or descent, notably from the Rand, so present-day Gauteng, who visited southern Mozambique every year for tourism. Uh, mostly beer and prawns and beach. And Silva's design does, may also be seen as heralding architectural strategies deployed more recently in uh, what um, Al Sayyad has written as heritage sites that have a legitimate claim to an authentic past developed for touristic purposes. In all these ways, the Fortaleza project contributed to the broader aim of constructing tradition to justify a Southern African region dominated by a minority of settlers of European descent. And you know, this was not just a Portuguese project as uh, recent research has established. For example, by the uh, early 1960s, there was a, a secret military alliance between Portugal, South Africa, and white Rhodesia to maintain Southern Africa under white domination, which was called the Alcora Alliance. So today, the Fortaleza belongs to the foremost public university of Mozambique, University of Eduardo Mondan, and the space is practiced in the everyday under conditions created as the result of a renovation project started in 1999. Uh, the design team was led by a US-educated Mozambican architect of Portuguese origin, from Coimbra actually, José Fourjage, who founded the university's School of Architecture. And at the time of this project, the 1999 project, the monumental sculptures recalling the military subjection of southern Mozambique were already collected at the fortress, having been removed from their pedestals at the two main urban squares of Lorenz Marx in 1975, but before independence, so during the, the, the transition period. The largest sculpture that we see here in this image is the equestrian statue of Muzin d'Albuquerque, the Portuguese army officer who had captured the monarch Gungunhana in 1895. Gungunhana was the sovereign of the northern Guni state of Gaza during the conquest by the Portuguese army of what is today southern Mozambique. Uh, we have to remember that armed resistance continued throughout what is today Mozambique until the 1920s particularly in the north. So actually only 40 years passed between you know, the military occupation of the whole of what is today Mozambique and the beginning of the independence war in 1964. So this was a very, very short period. 
Um, and this beginning of four decades of occupation without widespread armed resistance in Mozambique, there were other forms of resistance, obviously, strikes, revolts, etc., coincided with the early Salazar dictatorship, during which, as offers have noted, Mozin was adapted as a military patron saint, the secular saint of this regime. Uh, the Sarkastrum statue stood on, a, on top of a huge pedestal uh, in the central square of Maputo, uh, in front of town hall. Was cr nowadays there is a, a, a statue of Samora Michelle offered by North Korea on the same site. So the Equestrian statue was created by Portuguese sculptor José Simões de Almeida. There was a public competition in the mid-1930s. Um, and it, it was inaugurated in 1940. So it was demolished during the transitional government. Uh, and other statues uh, were also removed uh, in Maputo during this period, as we're going to see, and throughout Mozambique after independence. Uh, for example, nearby there's a statue of Salazar, uh, in the post office, but facing a wall, like is like being being punished during class, uh, and there's um, but most most of the statues that were in, in central Maputo were actually gathered uh, in in the fortress. So there you, we also have the statue of Antonio Ange, who was the Port Portugal's high commissioner in Mozambique, and he organized the military campaign led by Albuquerque in 19, 1895. And this statue was removed from the square right in the other main square of Maputo today, which is right in front of the fortress. Um, it had been installed there much earlier in 1910 by Alf Albert Freire Landad, who was the, gover the last governor general of Mozambique during the monarchy in Portugal. And um, the collection at the fortress also includes these two panels. These were the panels that were on the side of the pedestal two of the panels, there were others which were not uh, brought to the fortress, but these two panels represent um, the capture of Gungunyana, King Gungunyana at Shaimit. Um, so today the garden inside the fortress is one of the few places downtown uh, where the people of Maputo can come and sit in the shade away from the constant noise of car traffic and they're not forced to consume f food or drink. So this, this is one of the very f few places that's not a cafe or a terrace or something like that. And you can just sit and relax for a while, and people do so. And most are quite unconcerned with these demonumentalized demon representations. And, you know, I found a lot of references in, in the archive in Maputo that, you know, show that people in 1960s Maputo, uh, Lorenzo Marx, were also reasonably unconcerned about uh, these statues. For example, uh, from the minutes of the meetings of the town hall, I learned that the statue of Antonio Enz was used by the people who used to wash cars to dry their, their you know, the cloths that they used to clean the cars, etc. And this was seen by, uh, interesti interestingly, it was a a black older man that complained about this and thought this was und undignified. Um, and so it is visitors who do not practice the space of downtown Maputo every day uh, that are most attentive to the representations. And these are mostly either tourists, mostly from South Africa, uh, or students in small groups that are visiting downtown. And uh, tourists in particular are very drawn to the panels and they serve as background for photographs. Uh, these ones are behaving in a dignified way, but I, I've seen white South African tourists like standing next to the Portuguese soldiers doing like this. And, uh, this this is, was something that I, I saw more than once. And um, this, but what's important here is to understand that these subjects are pressed practicing the space under conditions that articulate the persistence of what I call a post-colonial spatial pedagogy deployed by the Mozambican state in the decade after political independence. How much time do I have left? Five minutes. Five minutes, okay. So this post-colonial spatial pedagogy um, was an assemblage encompassing the curtailing of the market in urban space 
participatory interventions in so-called peripheries, and the management of these built legacies of colonialism. Um, so by the, by, the, um, by the late 1970s, uh, the state began to face the need to manage the built heritage of colonial occupation. They were mostly occupied with nationalization of rental housing before that. And, and there was um, a decision in the late 1970s to create a committee in each provincial assembly to identify and inventory what were called historical places. And also a decision, and I quote, that it is important to conserve as a symbol of the tenacity and determination of our people, as a memory of, mu of humiliation and foreign domination, and as a source of inspiration of teaching for the coming de generations, all the historical vestiges of the creativity of the struggle of the Mozambican people, as well as of those as well as those of the foreign colonial presence in Mozambique. So it was decided that, you know, these monuments should not be destroyed. They have to be maintained and eventually reframed in many cases. Um, and um, this is also, I, I, I brought these images because this is also in the fortress. It's a, a, a sculpted coffin that symbolically holds the remains of Gungunyana. And uh, students, Mozambican students, usually like to take their pictures here and they do victory signs next to the coffin. Uh, so it's very interesting, it's a very interesting space because at the same time there might be a white South African tourist uh, celebrating the capture of Gungunyana and Mozambican students making the victory sign next to the coffin, you know, in the same half an hour. You know, such is the unruly fortune of colonial constructs, as Jacob says. So, now I'm trying to, going to be a little bit faster, talk about this unchallenged pedagogy in democratic Portugal. I'm going to start by showing two state exhibition spaces. Um, and then also some spaces of finance and consumption. And these are just examples, you know. Anyone that walks around Lisbon and Porto can find a lot of spaces, and some people have actually done maps, very interesting maps of these representations. Um, so, in contrast to this reframing of heritage in Mozambique, Political democratization in Portugal did not entail critical reflection or challenge to another kind of spatial pedagogy. The constant reinforcements of a sense of inequality through urban memorials of colonialism. In, a roundabout, in the roundabout called Empire Square at the center of Foz here in Porto stands a monument that initially marked the entrance of the 1934 colonial exhibition at Porto's Crystal Palace Gardens. Interestingly, this monument was dismantled after the exhibition for 50 years. And it was rebuilt in its present location in 1984, so 10 years after the Portuguese Revolution, during the administration of the mayor, Paulo Volada, who led a liberal conservative coalition. As were many of his contemporaries, Volada had once been a settler. He worked in s as a civil engineer and a contractor in Mozambique from in the 1950s and later in Angola. And at the time, many Mozambican construction workers, and also in Angola, labored under what was called in Mozambique the Shibalo system, that is, you know, forced labor, which existed until the 1960s, officially. However, evocations of their bodies are entirely absent from this monument's representation of the Portuguese colonial effort. Instead, it celebrates, from 1984 onwards, the various male expertise is crucial for colonization. You have the doctor, uh, the soldier, etc., and then you have a woman, so female reproductiveness is also celebrated. And even very few citizens walk close enough to it to appreciate its content. Uh, this evocation of the colonial exhibition is valued as evidence of an important event in the city's 20th century history. For example, in 2009, the Foz Ward Council vigorously con contested plans by the Metro 
to move the monument from its central position in the roundabout. At the time, there was the idea to do a line uh, through there. In addition, rebuilding the monument was seen as a very important detail of Valado's work as a mayor. Uh, thus, in the section of the webpage of the University of Porto, dedicated to illustrious alumni, this decision, this is just a paragraph, a very short paragraph, and this decision is foregrounded by the University of Porto as an important feature of this man's biography. The director of the 34 exhibition, Enrique Calvão, explicitly conceived the temporarily transformed gardens, the Crystal Palace gardens, including this monument, as a teaching space, and he was particularly concerned with the colonial education of children. As he wrote in an exhibition's newspaper, we do not assign today in the education of the child a role to colonial education, so necessary to achieving the highest of objectives faced by the Portuguese nation. And what's very interesting was that Valada, who visited the exhibition when he was 10 years old, so the mayor, he visited the exhibition when he was 10 years old in 1944. And he himself suggests that Galvão's pedagogy of inequality was very effective. So he wrote a text called Love of the Homeland, in which he says the colonial exhibition had an emotional component, so delicate that children of those times, like me, still recall today young Rosita and little Augustinho. These were young children from Gainia that were being exhibited for months, so they recall them with tenderness. And the long rosary of striking figures like the Landin soldiers and the fathers of the missions. Everything remained in our memory. So, you know, uh, I have to finish because otherwise I would be here for, uh, I have a lot to say about this issue, but I, I'm just going, I think you've got the gist of the argument. Um, so there's other spaces like Lisbon's tropical garden. This these are um, busts that originate in the Institute of Anthropology in Porto and were placed there for the 1940 exhibition in Lisbon. They're still there uh, with no explanation whatsoever. And these are so-called ethnic types of the empire that are spread throughout um, the, the gardens. And there's also a lot of representations in, you know, commercial spaces, business spaces. This is very close to here, if you wanna take a look. It's in, uh, this, it's in the lobby of the so-called Palacio Atlantic, which was the headquarters of uh, a private bank. It's, um, it's a, a design by, by the sculptor Jorge Barradas, who had, was very influenced by a sojourn in the African island of Saint Tomé, and um, the, I'm just showing a fragment here, so the, but this is the idea of colonization. What's being represented here is the idea of colonization as a mode of social elevation for the Portuguese, and particularly for peasants. So this man here in the panel to the right is a, is a peasant living his village house, and then once he crosses the Atlantic, there's a little boat in the, in the middle of the panel, he crosses the Atlantic to Brazil, and he becomes a gentleman, and there's <laughs> black man carrying his stuff, you know. Um, and so this is obviously still there. Anyone can go and take a look at it. And of course, there's the there's many many examples in Porto, but everybody knows the panel in front of Casa Oriental. I don't think I have to describe it. Um, so, in conclusion. While in post-colonial Mozambique sculptural representations formally celebrating domination have been redeployed by the state as a means of fostering autonomy, in contemporary Portugal, political democratization has not entailed a challenge to the persistencies of a colonial rationality of government, which operated partly through a pedagogical aesthetic of racial inequality. Instead, the violence of the spatial division inherent in the representation of African bodies as an equal has been neglected in relation to a sustained and hegemonic discourse, or almost hegemonic today, of Portugal imperial reason founded upon a developmental valuation of cultural difference. I'm of course referring here to the idea of lusotropicalism. 
Recalling Mozambique's post-colonial spatial pedagogy can help historians of the built environment and architects mitigate the conditions that engender experiences of spatial violence. However, expert knowledge of the city tends to define the oppositions that undergird the experience of spatial violence as technical or, and even ahistorical instead of political and contingent. So it is crucial that scholars and citizens and professionals work collectively towards forms of architectural and planning knowledge that are not inimical to democratic urban government. Deliberation on how to acknowledge the violence of memorials of colonialism should be properly political to render a decolonization of contemporary urban planning in Portugal and elsewhere in Europe. This can best be accomplished through the politicization of urban memorials of colonialism, possibly fostering urban design and planning strategies that are more aware of the authorship of the colonial legacy in cities. So just to summarize, you know, I think there's a place for protests and activist action against these memorials. Uh, in, you know, um, it was crucial in these last few months of bringing this issue to public attention. Um, and of course, the issue of the offense that these representations cause is also important and we must take it into consideration. But uh, as an architectural historian, as an architect, I think our role has to be first and foremost to inform the debate, inform the activists about, not about the representations as such, but their long history, their authorship, the political projects that were sometimes various political projects that were associated um, with these representations, with these spaces. And I don't think we should tell people as experts what should be done about these spaces uh, because that's just part of the colonial logic of expertise. I think what we, what we should do is inform the public debate and inform political deliberation. I think activism now about these issues has to move to uh, the political arenas that exist. You know, these issues can be raised uh, with the municipal assemblies, with the municipal chambers. Uh, that doesn't always work. We saw it in Bristol, you know, they were arguing about this in the municipality for 10 years about the Colston statue that got thrown in the arbor. But still we have to try because that political pro process is also a pedagogical process in which activists can engage people that are horrified by people painting Padre Antonio Vieira statues. And we have to, to do that engagement because, you know, um, and I've, I think one way of, of doing it was also changing the debate to the kind of lessons that these statues continue to impart, even to children, you know, to the young Portuguese citizens, regardless of their skin color, you know. And, uh, you know, I'm particularly concerned about that because I have a three-year-old daughter and I don't like her watching this, these kinds of representations. I don't, I don't think it's good. But on the other hand, I think we have to um, also be, I, I brought this image, this is an island that exists in the, in the uh, tropical garden in Lisbon. And the way it was in 2014, it was recently refurbished, but it's more or less the same. And this is another exhibition village that existed in 1940, so where people were being shown for several months. And here we have the opposite problem, in which something that should be remembered was actually completely erased from the place. So I think we shouldn't be only discussing what to do with these racist representations in our cities, but what to do about uh, these histories that are no longer vi visible uh, on the site. Thank you.